Hey everybody, it's Brian Asbury, and I just wanted to welcome you to today's episode. If you could, like today's episode, hit that subscribe button, and let's continue to grow the Developmentally Speaking brand. Today my guest is world travel professional wrestler. You've seen him on WWE, Impact, AEW, Mr. Mr. Lince Dorado. How are you, sir? Thank you, thank you. It's the uh, 2010 and 2011 Mr. Puss in Boots Lucha Lisa Dorado here on the podcast. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me on here, bro. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the time out to come on today. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question that you've probably been asked a million times, and I do apologize. But what made you want to get into professional wrestling? Honestly, man, just everything about it. I remember very vividly. Um, one time my mom and my stepdad wanted to take us out, me and my older sister, and uh, we ended up going to an event. Um, and sh- they weren't looking for a wrestling show, by the way, but we ended up going to like this theater that um, had a ring. And I remember very vividly like walking with so many people and there was two dudes in the ring like wrestling. And by that point in my life, I've literally watched like Lucha Libre and, and Puerto Rican wrestling. But to me, it was kind of presented a little bit different than the American style. So uh, my mom and my stepdad didn't like the event. They left almost immediately. And I just kept remembering like, what is this? Like, what is this? And and um, later on in my life, maybe about a month or two later, my my uncle, he stopped by my house in the morning to come take us to school. And this was in 94. And, um, you know, back then we had VHSs and VA, uh, VCRs and stuff. And he was like, hey, you have to watch this event that I recorded last night. I was like, All right, cool. So he puts on this wrestling event from the night before and he's fast forwarding it on the VCR. And like, you know, back in the day, if you fast forward it, you could see the whole thing basically in like fast motion. So <laughs> he starts to show me this uh this pay-per-view and I'm like, my brain is melting. And then he pauses and he's like, you got to watch this. And it's the uh, casket match, Yokozuna versus Undertaker from the Royal Royal Rumble 94. And that was the first time I saw wrestling that wasn't like pin or submission. Like it wasn't presented as sport. It was presented as entertainment. And um, I was hooked. I was like, man, no matter what you show me at that point, like I'm going to I'm going to be in that casket match. I'm going to be in the <laughs> ring with those guys. I'm going to be uh, in, in the WWE one day. And, um, you know, couldn't tell me anything else. <laughs> so at what point did you decide this was something you were going to pursue? What age did you start training or uh, working I, in the schools? I, okay, so I started training. Well, I did, like, a lot of amateur wrestling, thinking that that would help me out, like every other, you know, kid back then. Um, and of course, like me and a bunch of other guys, we did a lot of backyard wrestling. We actually had a ring and we kind of taught ourselves a lot, um, you know, in the ring and out of the ring. Cause we were doing like video edits and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I, I think at that time when I was like 16, I was like, you know what, I'm about to, I'm, I'm serious into amateur wrestling, but I'm not that serious where, you know, I'm not, I know after high school, I'm just gonna, you know, pursue wrestling. So Long story short, um, you know, I knew by like 16 I wanted to do it. Um, you know, we were wrestling already in the backyards and stuff like that. By the time I was 18, I think uh, Tommy Cairo from ECW came to one of our backyard shows and uh, he directed us to the ECW arena in Philadelphia. Um, I'm from South Jersey in the Camden area. And, um, you know, he said, hey, there's a bunch of wrestling schools that run out of there. You guys should, you know, get trained professionally. And, that was it, you know. Long story short, we went, me and a couple guys, we went to a show called CCW's Best of the Best out of the ECW arena and saw a guy named Claudio Casagnoli, who ended up being my trainer later on, one of my trainers. And that dude had it all, man. He like he had the the look, he had the music, he had the the move set, you know, everything about him just screamed superstar. And I was like, if this is the kind of people that they're putting out, like I need to be in this. <laughs> Now that time, particularly that time, the East Coast was on fire. That was the place you wanted to be. So how was that when you decided you were going to start getting into wrestling? Because it, all eyes were on Philadelphia, Jersey, New York, like in that area. And like talent from all over the world was coming. Yeah, I mean, like just trying to stay as busy as possible. <laughs> There's my cat in the back. Uh, just trying to stay as busy as possible, get as booked on many shows. I, I, that's even the mindset still today you know um 
you know, you want as many eyes, you want as many as different opponents. That's, that's the, that's the good and bad thing about the Northeast is, you know, you can find a lot of people, but sometimes you get paired with mm -hmm. the same person for a lot of years. And, um, you know, I took the decision after a while up there, almost, almost a decade, um, that I needed to leave and do something else. But that East coast, I, I the West Coast right now is doing their thing, but the East Coast has always been a hotbed for pro wrestling and, you know, just New York, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, Jersey, Delaware. You can find shows every day of the week if you really want, which is kind of crazy because it never used to be like that. You know, you can find every every weekend, but not every day. Now people are wrestling Wednesday, Thursday, and it's kind of like it's trying to re rejuvenate itself mm -hmm. in a good way. How long did you train before you started working matches? So like I said, I think doing the backyard helped me out a lot because mm -hmm. I trained about uh, five and a half, six months before I had my actual first pro match um, train as a trained wrestler. Because I was actually having pro matches before I was trained uh, just because like the ability and the stuff that people saw. Um, but to actually get trained professionally and, you know, from start to finish took me about six months before I started wrestling, you know, every, <laughs> every day as much as I could. <laughs> And you stayed over in the, the East Coast, you said, mainly for a while. How did you come up with your, your look here? Well, th this look was actually given to me. Um, one of the first early on trainings that I had with Chris Hero, Claudio, and some other people, um, they tried to heckle us a little bit, knowing that we were backyarders, and they thought that we had to like chip on our shoulders and stuff like that. Um, so they actually tried to push us to do things that we weren't even like, comfortable of doing like springboards and stuff like that because even though we had a ring we didn't really use you know those kind of ropes because our ring was kind of makeshift so one day uh, in practice um you know i went to go do a springboard fell out of the ring but landed on my feet like a cat and like claudio if you don't know him he has these like really bad dad jokes but they're actually funny like you don't want to laugh but you laugh anyway and he's like oh he look he landed on his feet like a cat and i think that gave him the idea that um you know this dude was agile like a cat and you know lynx was where it's at <laughs> at what point did you start to notice that you were getting your name out there hmm honestly probably not to like later like the problem with me was that i was friends with everybody mm -hmm. right i'm a cool brother and stuff like that that sometimes it doesn't translate the lucha s and the the person that plays lince um, so th those two could get mixed up. So a lot of times I was just getting booked on some shows cause I was a good brother and, 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 and I was good and I am good. Um, but I think toward the cruiserweight classic, I started or two years before the cruiserweight classic, I really started to like find myself. I, I bettered my body. I bettered my mind. My mindset was totally different from the beginning. Not so much trying to, uh, please people rather than like, you know, do the best that I can and and go from there because at the end of the day i think i realized that i needed to please number one myself mm -hmm. and number two the people i was actually trying to impress which was wwe and that's who i was catering toward um at least when during that time now how did you start uh, getting on their radar like when we knew the cruiserweight classic was coming but how long before that were you actually trying to get on with wwe or they know they knew who you were I think it was a little bit of both. Like I was trying, but it was like a weird time for WWE. Um, I actually sent the same email or same type of email for 14 months straight and didn't get an answer until the 14th month. And I remember the person, Canyon Seaman, was like, if if we wanted you, you would know. And a lot of people would have taken that like pretty negative. But I was like, OK, finally, I know that he's reading my emails and I know that they're not going to you know junk or spam. And. At that time, too, I was making gear for a lot of the wrestlers in NXT, like Charlotte, Sammy Callahan, who was Solomon Crow, Pac, who was Neville, uh, Bailey, and a couple other guys uh, and girls down there. So they were kind of like pushing me to either try to get a tryout or or something. But long story short, um, again, having like the good people behind me and being a good brother, um, Claudio actually and Gabe Sapolsky actually had mentioned my name that, hey, you guys should use this guy. He's pretty local um, and he's good. Uh, he understands the style and he works, you know, all the styles, basically. Um, so they ended up calling me. Uh, Regal ended up calling me 
um, while I was making some gear actually for Bailey. And, um, you know, just invited me. Right? So I didn't really have a tryout. I didn't have any other interaction with WWE prior to that besides their talent and working with them on gear. And this was my first and oh, probably only opportunity that I had to showcase that what I can do, you know, or mm-hmm. that I got it. So how was that Cruiserweight Classic experience for you? Amazing. Amazing. Everything about it from start to finish was amazing. The whole experience, even inside the ring, outside the ring was amazing. Um, I, I ended up having to choose between WWE and TNA at that point because that Tuesday, the same week that the CWC was being recorded, which was uh, that Thursday, that Tuesday I wrestled for TNA and, um, you know, they offered me something, but I was so confident in myself with before even stepping into the ring for WWE or, or figuring out anything that I was like, man, they're going to sign me. I know, you know, my ability and I know my, my confidence level. So I told them no with, without even again, speaking to WWE and putting all my eggs in that basket. So long story short, um, you know, we show up, got a lot of i felt like i literally belonged there i don't know if that makes any sense but mm-hmm. I, I literally was like oh this is where and what i've trained my whole life for it was super easy for me to transition from like the indies to wwe um especially when i went to you know uh, with the producer come you know give him some like cues and stuff and i had said something that he was like exactly that's exactly what we're looking for here and as soon as he said that i was like okay more of this more of this kind of stuff so, you know, it, I, I, I learned so much within that one week that, again, by the second week, the second time that we were there in August or July, I'm sorry, I knew they were going to sign me. And they did at July 20, I think 24th uh, at 1124 p.m. That's, a, that's amazing. A lot of people I don't think would, would bet on themselves just from nerves or being scared of not knowing, you know, well, what if? And um, I think a lot of people are very, you know, thankful that you did bet on yourself and you did take that opportunity because it speaks for well, itself. The answer is always no if you don't ask. Mm-hmm. And um, if you're okay accepting that or if you're scared to hear it, then you shouldn't be asking. <laughs> you should just accept it. But I'm not that type of person to say or leave my um life and legacy in the hands of others it's always been my mentality i've always felt alone in my life uh even as a child so i've always had that survive on your own kind of thing and fail on your own kind of thing you know Mm -hmm. at the end of the day i don't think of myself as a failure i'm always thinking of myself as a learner because i i learned from all my failures you know Mm -hmm. wwe i could have failed you know the first or five times that i sent that email and got nothing back and could have you know, walked away totally happy, which it almost happened. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I'm my biggest fan and you have mm-hmm. to be your own biggest fan in this world of wrestling in order to, you know, make it somewhere. So I'm, I'm very thankful as well for that mindset that I've had for myself and installed in my kids, mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, like, yeah, you have to invest in yourself because nobody else will. Mm-hmm. Now, how was the transition to WWE? Uh, it was easy. Uh, like I said, I think coming up poor and struggling on the indies and then like coming to a a situation where you're not, you know, poor and, and, and on the indies anymore, definitely really uh, humbled me, but also didn't change my mindset. I still had that almost indie ish mentality when it came to grinding, Um, always looking for something better, always, you know, pursuing something uh, in order to make my, my career better. My, my trajectory didn't stop when I got there, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. it, it did hope my dreams because again i achieved my dream and it made me like conflicted on what's next but it didn't make me lazy or anything or like you know mail it in i always was uh progressive in my time in wwe when it came to being smart with my money being smart with my booking um you know talking to people having conversations and making sure that i'm not just looked at as like just another dude uh on their roster you know i again i've gotten to make a lot of great relationships with higher ups or people, legends all over the world. You know, the person that plays Lindsay Dorado, not so much Lindsay, because mm-hmm. uh, I don't walk around all the time with the mask, but it does, uh, it does help when people can see that you are multi-talented inside and outside the ring. And 
you know, probably another reason why I stayed in WWE for so long. Now, when you were there, did you was there any initial plans as time went on, or did you have to pitch stuff for yourself, or what, what was the initial plan for Lince? I don't even think they had any plans for any of the cruiserweights, honestly. They had a plan for the show, to have a show, and that was it. Everything kind of seemed to be week to week when it came to ideas and stuff. However, like I said, I was progressive in my booking, always pitching ideas, always you know, uh, suggestion things, compromising with people, um, always taking the time, especially if I wasn't on the show, to use the WWE's resources, like their social media group or somebody, to make some videos or content. Because at the end of the day, that's what you are. You're a content creator, businessman, and then a professional wrestler at the uh, WWE. And, um, you know, I, I just try to be the best that I could do. But yeah, there was no real plans um, until I had suggested all of us together but then it turned into like their idea rather than our idea mm -hmm. but um you know it was an idea you know it was better than nothing <laughs> yeah is there any moments that stand out more than others during your time in WWE? something you're you know most proud of or didn't think you'd ever get to i don't know if, it's, if i'm most proud of one particular thing in WWE rather than the whole thing mm -hmm. but i will say um i think i'll be known for that elimination chamber drop that i did just because of one how crazy it was it did it safely um mm -hmm. and two like leading up to it the story um of talking to vince and irs and jamie noble trying to convince them to let us do it and i, I honestly don't think they knew what i was going to do until i started climbing and then that's when everybody started freaking out but i think that would be my my biggest legacy people always ask me about that especially because it was the last thing that happened before COVID uh, mm -hmm. really hit next week. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's still, I almost have like nightmares thinking about it. Cause I remember I always told myself, don't look down. And that was the only time I looked down and realized like, I'm going to get hurt, but it's okay because it's WWE and it's the last thing that we're doing right now. So <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything um that you didn't get to do in wwe that you would have liked to have done i would have liked to have been tag team champions with uh metallic or Kalisto or you know something like that even even if the group held the titles and kind of like free bird it i thought that would have been cool which almost happened but i think the lack of confidence in lucha guys again this that's where the the disconnection comes because we can have a conversation like this and i'll have conversations like this with people over there but then when it comes to the writing team and the writing staff and like that process i feel like they just don't understand that yeah there could be lucha guys who can talk mm -hmm. and and entertain but um you know they want to make it so easy for the audience to digest that they're not accepting a lucha guy to talk and and entertain they just want you to be the lucha lucha guys that's what i was told I was like, all right, well, this, I said that. I said, well, if this is what you want, thank you, but this shit sucks. <laughs> and that, ultimately, that's what ended up um, asking for our release, literally that conversation. I said, well, if, I, I said, if, if you don't, I said, do you see us as their champions? And honestly, I said, no, um, you know, you're just the Lucha Lucha guys. And I literally was like, well, thank you very much. And, you know, that absolutely sucks. I think we went up, pursue something else and, uh, you know, ask for our release right there and then. We didn't get it right away, but, you know, we asked for it, so. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, you know, would think, oh, they're crazy if they would have asked for that. And it's not all about just working at a, at some place. It's about, you know, performing. It's about doing what's best for you because anybody can just work for WWE and sit on the couch. But the fact that you, you know, you went to bat for yourself and that you wanted to do things, you know, and I, I don't think it's fair that they just labeled you guys as the Lucha Lucha guys. And it's not the it's not their fault. I totally yeah. get it. It's it you're, you're literally WWE is a movie company, right? Mm -hmm. They make movies, so they just need one type of character for each type of character that they could think of. So, you know, they I get that's why I'm not upset. I get mm -hmm. it. I totally get it. Do I agree? No, I think they dropped the ball on some stuff. But at the end of the day, like it's not my company. You know, mm -hmm. I know what I could have contributed. I know you know what I can do, but I'm not gonna. You know, I could suggest, 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 but at the moment that work becomes 
and feels like work rather than like my passion and my dream, that's when I knew I had to walk away before I start to get bitter and angry about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And once the release happened, did you have a plan initially or? Wrestle, go back to wrestling, go back to making (laughs) gear. That's why I'm saying if I could survive the indies before that, survive Mm -hmm. life before that, I knew I was going to be okay. Like I don't mind being poor. I've been poor before, you know, obviously I'm not poor. Um, I'm still grinding, you know, between wrestling, making gear, consulting, producing, training, all that other stuff like that I'm doing that's not just in the ring. Of course, I would love to be in the ring. That's everybody, uh, if you're a wrestler's first passion. But if there's, you got to find other avenues in order to do it. You know, I don't want to go back to a real job. That sucks. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think I can uh, go back to a real job. That's why I'm trying to stay busy as much as I can doing a, a little bit of everything in wrestling and then doing it great too not just doing it at, at the bare minimum like i'm doing it at a high level always at a high level high performance and just making sure that at the end of the day people walk away with then that was good you know mm-hmm. that was worth it so life after WWE as a performer it, it's been busy it's been good it's been consistent um it, I would say it it is a little bit harder to do what you want to do when you don't have a home, right? Because mm-hmm. you're coming in more as an attraction rather than like a, a, a stay still where, you know, I'm there for three or four shows maybe, hopefully, but it, able to do a storyline. And that's what I've been trying to, to pursue more, try to pursue more story stuff, be able to talk and... and rather than just come in and be the Lucha Lucha guy. Cause then what am I doing? I'm doing the same thing I was doing in WWE for less money. Like that doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, so I, I'm trying to create the legacy and story of Lindsay, the way that I want to do it with, you know, the resources that I have right now on the Indies. And at the end of the day, it doesn't all have to be in ring based. Like I could make and produce videos at home with this character that I've created for almost two decades. And, and be able to, you know, do something fun with it. I'm just, it, it's finding the right people and the right resources to do it is become the difficult part. Mm-hmm. I've seen you've done some coaching recently. How did that come about? Good. I usually don't post about it. Like I, I coach uh, my own people, my own students and stuff like that. Um, I work with Natty and TJ. Sometimes I'll send them some people uh, depending on how much I think they need finishing. And um you know, as far as WWE at the PC, I, I think that was my fourth or fifth time there. I just, that was the first time I posted about it. Um, kind of just like get my name out there again for people to be interested in not only learning the TV style, but Lucha Libre style too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but WWE always brings me in and I always have a great rapport with them whenever I come in. This last time in particular was probably the best. I was able to, you know, coach with a lot of people, a lot of great people, Sarah Amato, uh, coach Bloom, uh, head coach over there, like literally we sat next to each other and just chatted philosophy about wrestling. So a lot of people don't understand and realize like I, I just don't do Lucha Libre and I just don't do wrestling. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a teacher at heart. I was a teacher before WWE. And, uh, you know, I have that same mentality when it comes to learning and teaching, you know, uh, professional wrestling. So I will be returning back there soon, a couple times more this year. And then let's see where it goes from there. Is that something you would like to do full time? I think it, once once wrestling is done, yeah, mm-hmm. I think I think that's my calling would be teaching, especially at that high level. Um, whether it be at the PC or at my own own spot, or just traveling around the world and helping schools and, and people of my my peers uh, get to that level. Because um, at the end of the day, that's where the money is, man. If you want to make money and a living. Like we could all have a passion for wrestling, but it, you know, passion doesn't pay the bills. You know, your passion will pay the bills, but passion doesn't pay the bills. Um, so yeah, I think that's where I'm going to end up doing. Um, basically, after wrestling is either opening up my own school. Uh, right now, I'm just using the spot, or uh, being a coach at the PC and just helping that generation be great. You know. Mm-hmm. Are, you st- <laughs> Are you still? Are you still making? Yeah. You're fine. Are you still making gear for other superstars? Yeah, but making s- still gear for a lot of people around the world, not just WWE. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I made last year was an awesome year for me, uh, making masks for Mercedes Monet and Trinity for her AAA debut. Uh, made a bunch of gear for you know Hit Row. Um, I made. What are you doing? Um, you know, a bunch of other people in the world, like throughout the world, I've been making gear since 07 
and uh you know 08 sorry and yeah 07 07 and 08 and you know i'm always learning too so i'm always excited for new projects and getting better but um you know right now that's become my bread and butter besides consulting and wrestling so is there any particular piece that you've done that's your favorite uh i i just maybe not my favorite but i just it's becoming my favorite that mass right here that i just did the pink one is a half ray half lince mass i just posted about it mm-hmm. um, so yeah this one i actually made um a couple days ago but i just wanted to try out an idea that i had and uh, basically, I just did a half ray, half me mass, and I this was actually like my favorite mass that I've made uh, mm-hmm. so far. I've made I made a bunch, but this one was really cool. Um, again, from start to finish took me a day. I didn't really have an idea what I was doing, but I was just practicing, which is what I mostly do when I make gears. Like I'm just practicing for whatever the biggest picture uh, piece I'm gonna make. Um, you know, but right now, yeah, just that's my favorite piece in my collection that I've made. Well, cool. Where can people reach out to you at? So you can find me on Instagram and Twitter, you know, just search up uh, Lince Dorado. I forget what it, what it is. It might be Luchador LD on Instagram and Lince underscore Dorado on Twitter. You could also check my website, LuchaLit.com uh, for all your, you know, Lucha Lit needs, bookings, uh, scheduling. Uh, merchandise, you know, you could interact, you could sponsor, you could do whatever you want. Um, if you're a part of my Discord, all my information is there. And yeah, Twitch, I'm also on Twitch. I always stream, I actually get a stream after this, uh, some gear that I'm going to make. That's why all my stuff is set up here <laughs> and we're getting ready to go. So yeah. If you had any advice to give to anybody getting into professional wrestling, what would it be? A hundred percent is not enough. You got to be a thousand percent. And what I mean by that is you cannot, if you want to make wrestling uh, and, and be successful, you have to make it number one. And unfortunately, that means everything else, your wife, your girlfriend, your kids, you know, your bills, everything else has to come number two. And if you do put wrestling number one and put your, you know, with a reasonable and be real realistic with yourself, that's the other thing, being real, be realistic with yourself um you know you can be successful this this job or this business and and profession is hard very very hard and grueling but it is and can be very rewarding if you're willing to put a thousand percent in hundred percent is not enough you know because there's a lot of people who say that they want to do it but it's not many who are actually willing to do the things that Mm -hmm. you know it takes to do it so if you're not don't even bother man you're just gonna fail but if you are Hit me up. I'll help you out as best as I can. (laughs) Well, I just want to say thank you for what you've done for professional wrestling and what you continue to do, sir. Thank you for coming on today. And if there's anything I can ever do, please feel free to reach out. I appreciate it, guys. If you ever uh, need anything else, let me know. I'd love to reshare and, uh, you know, repost anything. If you guys need any guests or interested in any guests you're not getting a hold of, please let me know. Uh, again, I am taking bookings for the rest of the year. If anybody knows of any promotions that would like to get Lucha Lit with your boy, let's do it. Um, I also offer seminars and gears, like I said uh, earlier on the podcast. So anybody else interested in that, you already know where to find me, LuchaLit.com. When do you have time to sleep? What is that? When I'm dead. I don't know what sleep <laughs> is. I don't know. What, I will say I probably sleep about maybe five hours a day, maybe. And, and I feel good, man. I just I, I go to sleep, wake up, work out, and there goes my energy. I'm back. I'm back, you know, kicking out. A lot of people could learn from having a worth e- work ethic like yourself, sir. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you. Takes a crazy one. Takes a crazy one to have this work ethic. 